Hi, everybody. This is lecture 10 in our series on the trivium. That is the first three of the classical liberal arts, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Today, we continue our discussion of the logic of propositions, looking at categorical propositions. This will be the main kind of proposition that we deal with in this series. Our title slide here presents an image uh, taken from one of our Google image searches of the four main types of categorical propositions. A categorical proposition places a subject under a certain category. So we're using the language of Aristotle there, and you can look back at our lecture on Aristotle's categories earlier in this series. But let's take a closer look. Aristotle, <clears throat> as with so many things in this course, was the first one to distinguish between the content of a proposition and the form of a proposition. So the content concerns the assertions that the proposition makes about reality. That can be true, that can be untrue. You have to use uh, observation, do some empirical looking around, and determine to the best of your ability whether a certain claim is true. Um, however, you can also look at the form of the proposition, and this concerns the structure or the arrangements of the various components of the proposition. Now, sometimes you're able to determine, even without empirical observation, whether a claim is, we would say, valid or sound, right? Whether the logic is right. So maybe all of your premises are true. Maybe you've done a great job observing the situation. Maybe you're bringing to bear true facts. That's good. Uh, that's good material for an argument. But if the reasoning that you're using to connect those observations, those premises, is faulty in any place, then you will end up with a false conclusion. So we're here going to focus on the form of a proposition. Uh, and that is... Uh, important to distinguish. Categorical propositions um, always have three parts, uh, and, and we're going to kind of, in a Procrustean way, squeeze propositions into what we're going to call here standard form in just a moment, so that these three parts are always clearly visible. The first part is the subject, and this is what the proposition is about. What are you talking about? What are you making a claim about? Um, the second part is the predicate, and usually that would come last. This is whatever is said of or predicated of the subject. So if you say, um, it rained yesterday, um, you're making a claim about yesterday's weather, uh, and you are making a claim that it rained, right? So you're, you're predicating the, uh, not really activity, you're predicating the fact of raining of yesterday's weather. The verb is what is used to connect the subject and the predicate. And the verb um, is is, in fact. And um, in many cases, you will need to change the normal verb in an English sentence um, in such a way as to make that is, that copula, um, apparent. Uh, it's called a copula because it connects the subject and the predicate. So we, we get our word copulate from that, which is kind of a polite word for, in, in, as it happens, sexual intercourse, right? Because two people are copulating. They are coming together with each other. And the Latin word for that is a copula. Uh, the predicate um, is combined with the subject in order to make an assertion. So in the example we have on the slide here, the term is grass grows, or the claim is grass grows. Um, and you could put that in something closer to standard form by saying grass, the subject, is copula growing. Uh, and that would make clear what claim is being made. Let's look at each of these three in turn. So um, Hauser, our guide through uh, the logic of propositions and through this whole series, writes the following. The subject of the proposition is what the proposition is about. And this is whether it comes at the beginning of the sentence, the end, or is stuck somewhere in the middle. So in this case, uh, these four examples, the subject is always at the beginning, but in the next lecture, as it happens, we're going to look at some cases where the subject might be elsewhere. Uh, right now, we're just trying to introduce what is standard in terms of a categorical proposition. There are four kinds of categorical propositions. Uh, here we have them listed. Uh, examples. All cars are red. Some cars are red. No cars are red. Some cars are not red. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Um, Aristotle is suggesting that all propositions are statable 
uh, all categorical propositions, are statable in one of these forms, um, that this is an exhaustive list of the kind of basic structure of categorical propositions. All four in this case have the same subject and the same predicate. Um, cars is the subject, and we symbolize the subject. Um, we, we can symbolize the subject using a letter. Um, so for example, here we might use S. And you often hear in logic people saying, all S is P, all uh, S is not P, something like this. Uh, the predicate in all of these cases is red. Uh, we call it the predicate because it is predicated of or said of the subject. So I'm, in this case, as we said before, placing a subject under a certain category. I'm saying it pertains to this category. It is an instance of this category. Um, in the previous examples uh, we have on the slide, all four have the same predicate, which is red. Um, and this predicate is said to belong to, apply to, be said of, or predicated of the subject. So you're making a claim. You're making an assertion. It may or may not be true. You have to check to see if it's true. Um, but um, you can place these assertions into uh, uh, combinations with each other to build arguments. That's what we're coming to next in this series. The copula, um, which we've already mentioned, um, is some form of the verb to be, or is, so is or are in the case of a plural. It connects the subject and the predicate. So we have a passage here from our author, Hauser. If we link grass and green together by adding is, then we have produced a categorical proposition. Grass is green. The copula linking directly together the subject and the predicate of the proposition is what makes it assert something. In grass is green, grass, which is in Aristotle's view a substance, is not exactly the same in nature as its color green, because that's a quality, not a substance, but green is united to grass in the sense that they are two aspects of one and the same thing. Uh, the green grass. Right? So you're making a claim about a substance and a quality, and you're linking these two things together and making an assertion about reality. When you write a paper or when you write anything, uh, a sentence always needs to include a verb. Um, because if it doesn't include a verb, then it's not saying anything. It's not making a claim about anything. It's not providing any information. It's just uh, referring to something in the world. Uh, but when we uh, form a sentence, or certainly a proposition, we want to be making uh, a claim or an assertion. So I've already referred to this um, standard form, and here we're using the letter S for the subject and the letter P for the predicate. Um, uh, in this case, uh, I've, I've changed the example here, focus on the structure of our examples. It should be about red cars, not friendly Texans, with apologies to Hauser. I thought red cars would be more straight to the point. Uh, they differ in their form, but not in their content, right? So in this case, let's take our example of red cars. If I say all cars are red, some cars are red, no car is red, some cars are not red, um, I'm talking about red cars in all cases, um, but I'm making different kinds of claims about them. Uh, and it can be understood, uh, the differences here, um, in a very simple way between quality and quantity. Right? Quality pertains to whether it is affirmative or negative. If I'm saying all cars are red or some cars are red, I'm saying yes, they are red. I am affirming that. Right? If I'm saying no cars are red or some cars are not red, then I'm making a negative proposition. The quality is negative. So you can always determine, look for if there is a not or a no, right? If there is, it's negative. If there's not, then it's likely affirmative. Um, you can also differentiate between the quantity uh, in the case of these four um, standard forms of proposition. Um, the quantity is either universal, you're talking about all of them, or it's particular, you're talking about just a part of the group. So all cars are red or no cars are red are both universal. You are making a claim about all cars all together. Uh, if you say some cars are red or some cars are not red, you're referring only to a part, whether it's affirmative or negative. The quantity, universal uh, being particular in this case, is the same. Um, the letters that are used to designate these, and you saw this already on the title slide, are A, I, E, O. 
and as with so many things, we're getting this from Latin. There's a long convention uh, of using Latin in this space of logic. Um, a uh, refers to a universal affirmative, all cars are red, uh, and that's the first letter of the word affirmo in Latin, which means to affirm. I uh, is a particular affirmative, so this is the second vowel in the word affirmo, uh, and then it's matched by nego, uh, which is the Latin word for uh, negation. So we have a universal negative is the first vowel in nego, an e, and a particular negative is the second vowel in nego, an o. So a, i, e, o are the four designations, and sometimes the i and the e get swapped out depending on how you want to list them, but this is the reason why we use these letters, and these letters, uh, highlighted now on the slide are very important, and we're going to refer to these in this series um, directly. We say this is an A proposition, or this is an O proposition. And so we see our examples of the four types of categorical propositions, which is our main purpose in this short lecture, just to get out this standard form. So an A proposition, all S R P, right? So all cats are mammals in this case. Um, an E would be no SRP, so it's universal negative. No cats are reptiles, that happens to be true. Some SRP, some cats are long-haired cats, and some S are not P. In this case, some cats are not long-haired cats. In this case, all of the examples happen to be true, uh, based at least on my understanding of the world, probably yours as well, um, but they also are um, proper categorical propositions stated in standard form. Another way to look at this is provided by this further chart um, outlining the types of categorical propositions. So you can think of them as universal or particular, as we've been doing, and then you can distinguish further under each uh, between positive and negative. And you could swap this around and start with positive and negative at the top. The important thing is you have kind of four possibilities that are being placed in different combinations in the standard form of these propositions. And so, friends, a short one. When we're looking for categorical propositions, we need to find a way to place them into this standard form. And in the next lecture, we'll look at uh, cases where the standard form is not so apparent, but you can kind of pull out what is the content, what is actually being said in a sentence by looking for that standard form and rewriting the sentence uh, in standard form. Thank you very much.